Well, how many of you glad to be in church tonight? Amen. Praise God. I want to welcome all of you, of course, especially uh, those of you that may be watching online. We're glad you're with us here this evening as well. Going to have a good time with the Lord, get a little Bible teaching in. Glory to God. You know, wind you up real tight, and turn you loose on the world. Glory to God. Sounds like fun, huh? Did y'all bring a Bible with you? Let's open our Bibles right away. Got to get going because I only got about so much time. And so, uh, let's see, where are we going? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, Proverbs 23. Proverbs, the 23rd chapter. And then also, if you'd like, uh, you can find 2 Timothy chapter 2. All right, Proverbs 23, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we're all going to be doers of the word this new year, right? A new you in 22 means you got to become a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Hallelujah. You know, a lot of folk, they rejoice in the word and, you know, they'll get all excited about it, this and that and the other. But it's the doer of the word, praise God, that has change occur within their lives. Not enough just to read it. Thank God for reading it and thank God for the truth. But I want to make an application. How about you? Okay, my wife's interested. How about the rest of you? Praise the Lord. We can get, you know, 16 people here, and glory to God, we'll find out. Anyway. So anyway, it's His Word. It's His Word. It is His Word. It is His Word. For everything that you and I face, the things we're dealing with, it's the knowledge of God, the knowledge of His Word that enables us or empowers us to bring about change within our lives. Jesus made the statement. He said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, everybody wants to be free, praise God. So the truth is found in what we know, you know, or I should say it this way, freedom is found in the truth that we know. And so that's one of the reasons why we have our midweek services and things of that nature. And uh, thank God we got a great facility that's halfway warm. You all doing all right? Yeah. And uh, of course, when it's what, six degrees out, we got a high of six tomorrow. Is that what somebody said? It doesn't matter. It's not right. Okay, so let's just get over that and move on to some warmer weather. I think we've been a little spoiled uh, <clears throat> because we've had such moderate, actually pretty nice weather. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, Glenn, that we've had moderate weather? Yeah. You know, here's my son-in-law. He's from Norway, and he whines about the weather. I thought, Norway, dude, you're like, you know, Norseman, you know, you've had enough of it? Okay, all right, well. That's, I suppose, legit, but uh, anyway. <clears throat> well, let's get into the Bible and not worry about all that. How about that? Praise God. Look with me these two verses of Scripture. I want to use them as our text for this evening. Uh, the first, of course, being in Proverbs chapter 23. Notice this uh, 23rd verse in the 23rd chapter of Proverbs. It says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Let's read that again. Buy the truth and sell it not. But also, it says, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. You know, in other words, you, you talk to some people, you know, and they say, well, you, are you in the stock market? You know, do you trade stocks and things of that nature? And, and sometimes you'll run across a person who say, well, you know, I don't, I don't trade uh, stocks and things like that, I invest. And so what they do is they, they find a position, company, whatever the case might be, that they decide, you know, can make money and things of that nature, and they invest into that company because they're investing, of course, in it so that it will make them money. Well, in this scripture, it says, I want you to buy the truth and don't ever sell it because it will profit you and it said also, while you're at it, get wisdom, understanding, and uh, um, what was the uh, third thing? Instruction. So <clears throat> if you and I are to get where we want to go in life, if we want to succeed in the things that we feel like, you know, that God has placed within our hearts, then we have to find out the truth or buy the truth, praise God, get the truth, and don't ever let go of it. Don't ever sell it. Let's look at this other verse of Scripture as a companion to uh, this verse here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Notice it says here, and Paul was writing, talking with Timothy in verse 15, 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says, study, everybody say study, 
It, should, it could say give diligence. I use the King James, but it says give diligence or study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be, uh, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he wants us to become students of the word. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but when you become a believer, you become a lifelong learner. And God wants you to learn or study the word of God. And he says, so that you may be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Well, if he wants us to rightly divide it, then there is that capability or possibility that you could wrongly divide it. Huh? In other words, you could distort what it is it said and, you know, make the Bible say something maybe that it didn't say. So we have to become students, you know, so that we understand the whole counsel of God, especially where the New Testament is concerned. And so he wants us to give diligence to it and study the Word of God so we know. And then one more scripture that we'll we'll read before I get into some of my comments is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And again, this is a familiar portion of Scripture, perhaps with many of you. But notice it says in cha- uh, chapter 12, verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world. Well, again, if it says that we're not to be, uh, the possibility exists that we could be, even as Christians. Huh? You know, I mean, it's one thing. He's, he's writing to the, church, uh, the, the saints that be at Rome. So he's talking to the church. And he's saying, listen, I don't want you to be conformed to this world, but again, rather be transformed. Everybody say transformed. Yeah, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's no transformation that can take place in your life until you start having your mind renewed to the word of God. Then it goes on to say that you may prove what is that good, that acceptable and perfect will of God. How many of you know God wants you to know his will? Now, you'll, you'll hear sometimes people out there, well, you know, God's sovereign and he's mysterious and his you know, ways to perform and you never know what he's going to do. Well, uh, I will say, yes, absolutely, God is sovereign. And <clears throat> he knows more than we'll ever know. But thank God he has made it possible for you and I to be able to know the truth or the will of God as it is recorded in the scriptures. So we got to do a little digging. We got to find out, you know, what that Bible has to say about different things and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> buy the truth and don't ever sell it. Hallelujah. Now, you know, whether you realize it or not, if you've been in the church here at the fellowship for any period of time, you know, there's a lot of things you've learned. Okay? There are a lot of things, you know, that have been life-changing and altering where your life is concerned because you, you, you finally you realize, I didn't know that. And all of a sudden you find it in the Word of God. Maybe it might be on your own, you know, where, you know, truth has come to you and you've realized, wow, I didn't realize I didn't know that. You know, there's a lot of things I didn't know, still don't know, but I'm a learning. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? So in talking about this and dealing with these matters, you know, you hear a lot, especially today, about myth, misinformation. Have any of you ever heard that term used here of late, misinformation? And uh, <clears throat> actually, it's lying, okay? If you just want to get right down to it, when somebody doesn't tell you the truth or they misguide you, it's lying, all right? But we don't use that term because it's not necessarily socially acceptable, But misinformation uh, regarding, I mean, any number of subjects, you know, if you talk about culture and politics and so on and so forth. But we see in the scriptures, or we could say it this way, we see that these things occur in the natural as we're all aware of, but the same thing happens in people's spiritual lives where there's misinformation given to them in order to thwart or to subvert or to send them in a direction opposed to what God's will is. Now remember the scripture we we quoted there earlier in Romans 12 and 2. It says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you, you, can prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. So the capacity exists for you and I to be able to know the truth. Aren't you glad for that? 
Thank God for the truth that we know. Glory to God. But there's a whole bunch more that we're going to learn and we're going to, we're going to know and we're going to walk in the light of it. But again, <clears throat> this misinformation thing is really what I want to talk to you about when it comes to people's spiritual lives because there's this attempt by the adversary of our soul uh, to keep people from enjoying God's best and experiencing all that heaven has to afford. Well, thank God he can't keep you from it unless you let him. Now, for example, simple thing. A lot of folk, you know, you, I mean, there will be people in the pulpit that say there is no literal devil. He's just some figment of people's imagination used to represent evil. Well, now that's not what the Bible teaches. huh? I mean, the Apostle Paul talked about the fact that, yeah, we, we have an adversary. Well, Peter said we have an adversary of the devil walking about looking to, to devour people's lives. And Paul said, we're, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. So, so evidently, there must be some truth or reality to this. And if you read the scriptures, you find that he was a fallen angel. He was one of the three archangels. And he said, I will be like the most high God. And God said, no, you won't. And all of a sudden, down he went. But it, it's literally, he is the God of this world. And so he endeavors, at least, to try to... Uh, bring people into bondage, and destroy people's lives. And here's the reason why, you guys. You are the object of God's affection. I mean, there, I mean, you are his prized creation, and he loves you. And the devil hates the fact that he loves you, so he goes after God's prized possession, which is called humanity, mankind, you and I, people. But thank God, praise God, you and I can shine as bright and shining lights in the world, glory to God, and give the devil a black eye knowing, praise God, that he's under our feet and he's been defeated. And it's the truth of God's word that allows you and I to be able to exercise this dominion over the adversary of our soul. So that's why it's so important to buy the truth and never let it go, to hang on to it tight. Because if you don't, then the devil will do what he can, again, to take it away from you. And uh, so I want to talk to you about how you can see to it that you don't become a victim of the devil. And not only that, because of his deceptions, become incarcerated by the lies of our adversary. And, and when you think about it, he is a defeated foe. Jesus went to the cross he, he died for the sins of the world. He rose victorious. Glory to God. The Bible says that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. Glory to God. Made a show of them openly. Triumphed over them in it. So thank God we have victory. But you've got to walk in the light of the Word of God in order to enjoy that victory. Are you listening to me? So you can't fall into the traps or the deceptions that hell offers you know, you got to pass them up. Everybody say, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, glory to God. For sure it is. And it's important that we understand these concepts when it comes. Because again, the only weaponry that hell or Satan has against the believer is lies and deception. He has to deceive you. See, when, when, you, when you embrace a lie, you empower the liar. But if you say, no, that's not true, I ain't taking that, you know, that's what's going on right now, you know, within the world. They're, they're pitching all these lies to people trying to get them to bite. And, they're, and people are realizing, like, this is a bunch of junk. What in the world are we doing here? You, you with me? Well, so in the natural, you see that occurring. Well, uh, who do you think's father in this whole mess? The God of this world, Satan himself, to try to bring people into bondage. But thank God we don't have to do that. Amen. Look with me to Genesis chapter 3. I want to look at a few scriptures here uh, uh, to help us in our understanding a little bit. You know, before I got saved, well, I didn't know nothing about nothing. But then when I got saved, you know, even the idea, like I said, you know, of the God of this world or the, my real adversary is not my neighbor but the devil. You know, I, not, I didn't know any of that. You know, I just was out there banging around just like everybody else. But thank God, I start getting hold of the Word. Now, notice here in, in Genesis chapter 3, notice it says here now how, uh, this is the King James. It says, now the serpent was more, what's your king, uh, what does it say, subtle? 
Okay? Does your Bible say anything different than that? Cunning, crafty, anything else? Shrewdest. So, so what I want you to realize is, is that there's a description here that's, that we're being given. And it says, now the serpent was more subtle, shrewd, crafty, or cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, now has God really said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the free." The, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said that you cannot eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then notice the serpent gave this woman this flat-out lie in verse 4 and said, you won't die. God knows. Notice what it says, verse 5, God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. They already were as gods, and they already knew the difference between good and evil. But the Bible says that he was the shrewdest, the most cunning, that he was subtle. And the reason I bring this to your attention is, is because when it comes to you and I as believers, you know, we need to be wise as serpents and yet harmless as doves. And when I say wise, I'm talking about having our head screwed on straight when it comes to the way that we think. Because if we don't, we can be led down paths of thinking that bring us into bondage. Amen? Well, God won't mind if I, you know, lie a little bit, or God won't mind if I'm a little bit dishonest, or, you know, what? Well, <clears throat> yeah, He will. Because the Bible says that you're not to do these things. And if you do, there's a consequence. But the devil will tell people. I remember when I was a kid, you know, growing up, and I seen a lot of things happen to friends and maybe upperclassmen or underclassmen, you know, above or below me. And, and uh, they were doing things that they shouldn't, you know, have done, and there was a consequence to it. But the lie that so many of us all believed was simply this, it'll never happen to me. You know, eh, it won't happen to me. Well, that's a lie. Because it could have just as well or very well happened to me. You know, I mean, if you're participating in the same kinds of things, you with me? But it's a subtle kind of lie that somehow makes you think that you are exempt from consequences as it relates to wrongdoing or whatever the case might be. And so, you know, we buy it, and of course, you know, then it starts giving shape and form to our lives, and all of a sudden we're doing things, you know, that, you know, we, we, we think we shouldn't do, so on and so forth, and, and then pretty soon here comes trouble. Are you with me? So this scripture says that he was more subtle. You know, when the devil used this serpent to talk to her, he was more subtle than anyone else, and he baited her, and as soon as he got her on the hook, you know, he whooped it to her. And then, of course, you know the rest of this story. Now, turn to 2 Corinthians in the New Testament. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 11. I know we're looking at a lot of scriptures tonight, but you know what? That's probably not a bad idea. Notice what it says here, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's look at verse 3 together. Um, and, and let me, let me uh, set the stage for this. Uh, there was some controversy with the Corinthians about Paul's authority as an apostle, and, and um, uh, they were basically, it's kind of like, well, who made you the boss kind of thing, you know, and so Paul was just basically saying, you know, uh, you, know uh, you might have a lot of teachers, but you don't have a lot of fathers, and I'm, I'm the one that gave birth to you. So because he loved them, he was telling them the truth. And in that context, he says in verse 3, 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, he says, But I fear, in other words, I'm concerned for you, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ." So in other words, he was concerned about the fact that they had accepted things that weren't true and it had the, the possibility or the potential at least to overthrow them. Does that make sense to you? 
Okay? And so he's addressing that in this particular situation. Back up to the second chapter of 2 Corinthians. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with another situation where there's basically there was an immorality within the church. And they just, they, he told them how to deal with it in the first letter he wrote to them. And then in the second letter, the guy who was involved in all of this repented. Everybody say hallelujah. So he's now addressing the man's repentance about, you know, uh, receiving him back into it. And, uh, the sheepfold instead of harboring, you know, ill will or unforgiveness or whatever the case might be because of this person's mistake. And that's kind of the, the, the setting for this. And he said... Uh, Um, notice in verse 10, he said, to whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. He said, for if I forgive uh, anything to whom I forgave it, uh, for your sake forgave I it in the person of Christ. So that that gets a little wordy, but notice what he then says in verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his what? Devices. Devices, schemes. He was more subtle. He was more cunning. He was shrewd. And the reason that I bring this to your attention is is that's why God's word as the foundation within our lives is so important. Because if you don't establish your mind, your thinking, your belief, all of these things upon the known will of God, then you'll end up in places that you don't want to be in. And thank God we can. Okay? You know, <clears throat> and so sometimes we have to stand against, you know, things that come up, you know, that people are talking about that, that aren't biblical or aren't scriptural or anything of that nature, you know. And uh, thank God we can do that. We're not against them, but truth is truth. Are you with me? You, you just say, well, no, huh? We ain't buying that. I'm not buying that. I don't believe that. That's not what the Bible says. So again, it becomes so important for us as believers to make sure that we're renewing our mind to the Word of God on a regular kind of basis. Hallelujah. So, 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 how do we do that? I mean, how does that work? Look with me to uh, Second Corinthians chapter ten. You're there close because all of this is within the context. I mean, it'd be good for you to read First and Second Corinthians. Paul has a lot of insight and helpful information here for us as believers, and it's through the washing of the water or the word that we we get a clue, okay? But notice here in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse uh, 3, the Apostle Paul is writing. He says, now though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In, In other words, we're living in this human, you know, natural body, and we're living in this earth. Thank God we're in it, but we're not of it, Right? And so he says, even though we walk in the flesh, we're, our warfare, the, the battle, the issues that you and I are having to deal with are not carnal or according to the flesh. And then he goes on then to say, to explain what he means by that in verse 4, because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or weapons of the flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of, what's your Bible say? Huh? Strongholds. Strongholds. We don't ever think about, you know, maybe that we've got strongholds in our lives. Now, notice what he's talking about here when he makes reference to a stronghold. He says, again, let's back up in this verse. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, listen to this. Casting down, King James uses the word imaginations. Uh, It might say, well... They have the King James. It may say reasonings. Are you with me? Okay. So casting down imaginations or reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself. Now listen, uh, exalts itself against the what? The knowledge of God. Okay. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what does that mean? It's, it, it's really, it's just talking about a simple thing that even though we walk in the flesh, we're not worn after the flesh. These weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to pull down reasoning, strongholds, or imagine, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself 
or at least attempts, to exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, (laughs) hallelujah, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And part of that process is just you and I renewing our mind to the Bible. Huh? You know, it's not some heavy, you know, duty task or anything like that. But, I, but if we'll just allow our, our lives, and here's the problem, you know, in a lot of Christians' lives, the problem is, is that they're simply not being influenced enough by the Word of God. They're certainly being influenced. There's all kinds of influences in our life. But the Word of God has got this little bitty place, you know, that is trying to combat all of these things that go on within our lives and in the world in which we live. How many of that makes sense to you? Okay. So it's important for us to understand these things as the Apostle Paul is revealing them to us so that, praise God, we've got what it is that we need. Now turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures tonight, but praise God. You know, I guess we're trying to let the Word do the speaking. In 1 Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> notice in verse 8, it says that you and I are to be sober. Be sober. Any of you ever been around a drunk person? You know, when, when, when you're around a drunk person, that person is not cognizant of a lot of things that are going on around them, and they really don't care. You know what I'm saying? But he's saying, I don't want you to be that way. I want you to get your antennas up here and... Pay attention. Be sober, be vigilant or watchful, careful, some of your translations may say. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, okay, um, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. It didn't say he could. He's just looking, you know. Now, notice in verse 9 what you and I are to do. Whom resist, everybody say resist. Yeah, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of tests or trials or afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You know, a lot of folk, you know, they get into these situations in their lives. And, you know, misery loves company, and so does the devil. And he'll come, he'll put his arm around you, he'll start telling you about how bad you got it, and how nobody's got it like you do, and all of this. Well, that scripture right there tells you that everybody deals with the same stuff you do, okay? And the way that you and I battle it is through resisting it in the faith. In other words, resist what's coming your way with the faith that's in your heart because of what you know from the Word of God, okay? My wife and I, we just got done going through the COVID deal, okay? I'm minding my own business. I'm a believer. I love Jesus. I've been redeemed from sickness and disease. Glory to God. But you know, on the 30th of December, it showed up. Well, I'm not trying to suggest to you that I'm going to go around in denial that I don't have COVID because I'm sick, okay? Now, I'm not saying I'm sick, but let's get real, all right? And so when I, when I deal with this in my own heart and mind, I stand against or I resist what it is that's trying to invade my life, as, as we both did, okay? So I'm resisting it, what? In the faith. And I know that the same kinds of things are going on in the people that are around me. I'm not in denial, but I am not accepting it as a part of what belongs where my life is concerned. So I resist it. You know, every time we'd pray, praise God, we didn't, you know, you you don't feel like eating, all you want to do is sleep, you know. And when we'd pray over malto meal or whatever we were, you know, What sounds good? Eh, How about some uh, cream of wheat, you know, or whatever? We just say, Father, we just want to thank you right now that by the stripes of Jesus we were healed. That Jesus himself took our infirmity and bare our sickness. (laughs) And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. You say, well, that's foolish. Well, you can do what you want. But I'm telling you what, I've come to know the truth, and the truth says that it'll make me free. And so I'm standing here today, glory to God. You say, well, you know, but if you really had faith, you wouldn't. Now, come on, man. Give me a break. 
I'm living in this world. I'm not of this world. I don't have to accept what's going on in the world. I can resist it. I can stand against it in the name of Jesus. And he said, praise God, that he would deliver me. So that's where my faith is. Amen? Sooner the better. Are you listening to me? But, but the whole reason that I bring this, this, this line of thinking up uh, to you tonight is, is because if you're not careful, human reasoning, you know, a lot of people when these things, well, you know, I thought that the pastor said, you know, that we were redeemed from sickness and disease, you know, and really if we were, then how come we're doing this? And that must not be true. I mean, you know, that's all much of junk, you know, this whole faith stuff, it don't work. Oh yeah, it does work. Huh? Just because somebody gets attacked by the devil or the God of this world, it doesn't mean that God's word's not true and that it doesn't work. But if you're not careful, you'll let that, you, it'll take you down this path, and then all of a sudden you cast away your confidence, and then all of a sudden you're out in the weeds someplace and you don't know what you believe or why you believe it. So you got to stay true to the word, irregardless of what it is that you may be experiencing. Are you with me? Hallelujah. And the thing is, well, there's a lot more that I could probably talk about in that context, but, but it's important. So the fundamental answer, if, 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 if we kind of go back to what it is that I'm talking about here this evening, is, is first of all, the discovery, everybody say discovery, <clears throat> and the embracing, everybody say embracing, the embracing of the truth, the discovery and the embracing of the truth. Now, understand, you know, when you get started in your walk with God, there are a lot of things you don't understand. It's like, God, how come, you know? I mean, I guess we could sit around and say, okay, it's day seven, you know, uh, we're ready for something to change, okay? How come it doesn't change? Well, I don't know, but man, I'm still going to say, Father, I want to thank you for my health, my healing, that you are my healer. Glory to God. I, mean, I don't know. You know, you say, well, if you had more faith, I would have left sooner. Well, all right, big dog. Uh, you take care of it and I'll take care of it. How about that? Are you with me? Thanks for your enthusiasm. I, I, I'm just saying that in many cases, a lot of times, people are just not getting enough of God's word its influence in their life. Are you with me? And so it becomes important that this becomes something regular where our lives are concerned. Jesus modeled how we handle, listen to this, Jesus modeled how you and I are to handle both the, the, the internal questions that we have and the external challenges that we face as believers, because you're going to have them. You know, I mean, in your brain, you're, you're trying to, you know, understand this. There's the internal questions. There's the external challenges that you have to deal with. And Jesus modeled how it is that we're to deal with it. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Let's go over to Luke's gospel chapter 4. We'll take a look at this. Boy, you guys are good listeners. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 4. Glory to God. Here, here's a pattern. Uh, 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 um, a mold, if you want to call it that, a template, maybe is a better way of putting it, that you and I can use, uh, that he dealt with. Now, Jesus never did a thing until he was 30 years of age, okay? He was the son of man or son of God uh, in its fullness, but he was not involved in any kind of ministry or anything until he reached the age of 30, the Bible tells us that he went out to John the Baptist and was baptized of John in Jordan. The Bible says that he came up out of the water and there was a voice that spoke from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so, you know, uh, people that were there, you know, witnessed all of that. But now we're on the backside of that. And let's start in verse one. We're going to read through verse uh, 13. So Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, everybody say full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, he got baptized in water and the Spirit of God descended and it says, being full of the Holy Ghost, he returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness, probably to get his marching orders and what it is that he was going to be doing. Verse 2, it says, and being 40 days, uh, 
tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterwards was hungry. So the devil said to him, you know, and isn't this just like the devil to wait until you're at your weakest and then to come and proposition you? It's just like him, you know. When you feel your worst, it's when he shows up and says, well, yeah, that whole faith stuff, that's really a big deal working for you right now, isn't it? You, you, you with me? And that's exactly what happened. So he said to him, if you be the son of God... Command this stone that it be made bread. Now let's, let's stop for a minute and let's, let's ask ourselves, what's the temptation that Jesus is dealing with here? Well, you say, oh, well, simple, you know, he's been 40 days without eating, he's hungry. No, that's not the issue. The issue is he is being given an opportunity or being tempted to question who he is, his identity. And the same thing's true with you, dear child of God. So many times, you know, we question whether God loves us. And I made mention of that song that I listened to here a while back, you know, that, you know, I was wondering whether God was really faithful. What a bunch of junk. I mean, what an absolute bunch of junk. It it appeals to the solical part of people's emotions, but it does nothing to help them in terms of the reality of God's living word and who he is, where his nature and where his character is concerned. Sells a lot of records, probably but it ain't worth a hoot in any place to have as far as the way that you believe. Are you with me? So in this case, Jesus' temptation was to question whether he was the Son of God or not. Okay? So the devil baits him and says, well, you know, if you are, man, turn the stone into bread. Then we'll all know. Well, thank God he didn't bite. And notice what it goes on then to say. The devil said this to him. And in verse 4, Jesus said, he answered him saying, what's the next three words? Huh? It is written. Glory to God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Every word of God or every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, then the devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him to the kings, all the kingdoms of the world and in a moment of time. And then the devil said to him, well, you know, all this power will I give to you and the glory of them for it's been delivered to me and to whomsoever I will, I can give it. If thou shall therefore worship me, I'll give it all to you. It'll all be yours. And Jesus, thank God, answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is, what? Written. Glory to God. It is written, it is written, it is written. Glory to God. He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. And then finally he brought him up to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him again, If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down from thence, for it is written. Now, isn't this interesting? The devil uses the Bible, huh? To try to again distort the truth about, you know, in this situation. So he, he says, uh, you know, it's written that he'll give his angels charge over you and keep you, and in their hand they will bear thee up, lest you should dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus, thank God, answered and said to him, It is also said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended the temptations, he departed to, uh, from him for a season. Hmm, interesting stuff, isn't it? Huh? He modeled how we're to handle the eternal or internal questions and, ex- and external challenges that we face as believers. And so the way that you and I as believers, how we battle these things, temptation or the lies of the devil, is with the truth. Everybody say the truth. So let's, take, let's, let's roll back here just a little bit and think about this with me. He comes to Jesus and he said, well, if you're the son of God. So he questions his identity, right? He does the same things to Christians. He does it all the time. 
Why? Because he wants to defeat them. How does it come about? He says, well, if you were a ch- real Christian, if you were a true Christian, you wouldn't this, you wouldn't that, you know, this wouldn't be going on in your life, you know. I mean, he'll use anything that he can to try to defeat you. So what you have to do is you have to find out where it's written, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And old things have passed away, and thank God everything else has become brand new. I'm a new creation in Christ. And not only that, but this whole plan that God instituted was his idea. All these things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself. God loves you, man. You know, the devil, you know, he'll tell you, well, God doesn't love you. If God really loved you, he'd be helping you. He'd be doing this. He'd be doing that. He'd be doing whatever. I don't even know why you're serving him. What's the matter with you? Are you with me? And I mean, you know, after all, I mean, if God's God, I mean, how come he isn't showing up? How come he didn't turn this thing around? How come change hasn't occurred? I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's like being shot at with a machine gun. And the only way that you can combat it is you got to do the same thing Jesus did. And you got to say, no, it's written that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation and I'm in him. And thank God old things have passed away. That's why a lot of people get beat up. They're condemned. You know, about mistakes they've made or places, you know, all these different kinds of things. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses and washes us from all of that mess. But you got to know these things. You know, I remember one time. I was reading the scriptures, and the Bible says, there is therefore now, I don't know, I'd, I'd screwed up. I was a young Christian, I, was, I did something wrong. And, you know, so I'm condemned. I mean, I asked Jesus to forgive me, you know, which the Bible says, if you ask him, he is faithful and just. But I got to believe that. And I, I didn't believe that. Why? Because I didn't feel anything. I'm looking for this sweet pill of emotion that makes me feel as though God has forgiven. God doesn't deal in the emotional realm. I mean, he does, but understand what I'm saying. You know, we walk by faith, not the way you feel. And the Bible says if you confess your sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But I didn't have that down on the inside of me. So I'm reading the scriptures, and the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And I'm excited about that part, but then it goes on and says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And the devil says, but the problem is you've been walking after the flesh, so there is condemnation for you, Bubba. So now I'm, I'm in deep, dark doo-doo, you know? And I'm asking myself, you know, well, you know, what am I going to do about that? Well, thank God I kept reading. I said, thank God that I kept reading. Because if you go down into this scripture, and I'm going to have to look at it here. I didn't, obviously didn't have this plan, but uh, <clears throat> it goes on then to say, um, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. I knew I was in Christ. I knew I was a child of God, man. I'd been changed. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's where he got me right there. Well, you've been walking after the flesh, so there is condemnation. And then it goes on and says these things. But in verse 9, everybody say, thank God for verse 9. It says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And I said, gotcha. Because I knew I was in Christ Jesus. I said, you turkey. And that's just the way the devil is. If he can twist or distort the truth to try to bring you into condemnation, man, he'll eat your lunch. But thank God, if you get enough of the foundation of God's word on the inside of you and underneath you, then praise God, you got something to combat with. I said, you got something you can combat with. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let me see if I can figure out a way to unhook from all this. The way we battle temptation, the way you battle temptation, the way we battle temptation, And the lies of the devil is with the truth. So I encourage you, praise God, get in the book. Let the book get in you because it is your lifeline. It is what can settle things where your life is concerned. Um, You know, um, uh, you got three more minutes? Good, I'm going to take them. All right, 
Look, look here in this story. Notice uh, he had this temptation and the devil left him. Now let's look at verse 14. So Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit from the wilderness into Galilee. There went out a fame throughout all the region roundabout. Notice this particularly, verse 15, and he what? What did he do? He taught. He taught. Notice it goes on to say, he taught in their synagogues being glorified of, God, uh, of all. The, the point that I want to make in this, and I don't want to lose it, is the first thing that Jesus did to try to help people was to teach them. I mean, you're talking about the Son of God, or you're talking about God Himself, who sends His Son into this earth-born existence, and when His ministry begins, the first thing that He begins to do is try to teach people the truth. Well, I, He didn't try, He did. Now, whether or not the people accepted it or not, that was their deal, you know? The Bible says that Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease among the people. Teach, preach, heal. That was his ministry. But he taught. And you know, you can't, sometimes you can't hardly get somebody to sit down like what you're doing right now and listen to the word of God for an hour. You know? So, you know, it's like, well, dude, if you got a little 20 minute sermonette thing you got going on, I, I'm, I got time for that. Well, dude, you might as well go sit in the car because we need the washing of the water. We need a saturation of the Word of God. You got all this junk on the inside of you, and you want a 15 minute squirt gun thing to try to fix all your stuff. And that don't work. Okay? I'm sorry. Don't work. You got to be all in, baby. Huh? You know, when you push the button, when you decide which, one, which car wash you get, you're, you're after, the works. Okay? You want it all. Hallelujah. And, and so, uh, so anyway, he taught them. Verse 16. Then he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. Okay, so he's coming to his own crib or hometown. People, everybody knows him. And it says that as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place that it was what? He found the place that it was written. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me and so on and so forth. And then he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And there's a lot that we could get into with all of that. But I want you to, I want to focus on this final point, And that is, he found the place where it's written. You know, you got an area in your life or a challenge that you got going on in your life or whatever the case might be. You got to find the place where it's written. Find the place where it's written that you're a new creation. Find the place where it's written that says you're more than a conqueror. Find the place that is written that greater is he that's in you than, it, than he that's in the world. Find the place where it's written that himself took your infirmities and bare your sicknesses. Find the place where it says that because of his grace, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty could be made rich. Find the place where it's written, where your need is concerned, and God will cause faith to come up on the inside of you because that's what's written. But a lot of folk, they don't find where it's written. I don't know about you, but I think it's time we, I think it's a good idea for us to take the time to find it. You know, some people, you know, we're, I mean, we live in a world filled with anxiety, care, worry. I mean, it's everywhere. Well, you know, we need to find a place, praise God, where it's written that we can cast all of our care onto him because he cares for us and that we don't have to be careful about anything. You say, well, that's just an impossibility. Well, my Bible says that with God, all things are what? It's possible. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you don't fight battles. You don't deal with, you know, whatever the devil's throwing at you because of circumstance and everything. But I'm telling you what, praise God, he's redeemed us. He loves us and he wants to put us over. And I'm out of time. So hopefully, praise God, some of these things, you know, will help you uh, and bless you. There are a lot of other things that I could talk about, but I think you got a, a pretty good shovel full, huh? You know, you just take this home. You say, well, what do I do then, Pastor? I want you to just go home and feed on, meditate on, think about 
the Word of God, particularly the epistles and the Gospels, the New Testament. And just let, you know, take, give your brain a good soak, you know? Hallelujah, it'll bless you. And it'll help you, put you over in life. That way you can combat some of the goofed up, you know, things that people come up with. How many of you know people do come up with goofed up things? Oof, duh. Well, thank God you don't have to. We'll just stay screwed on to the right bolt. Isn't that right? Why don't you stand with me? Uh, you've been sitting there for 45 minutes or so. Give you a chance to stretch. We'll just commit these things to our, to our hearts here as we pray. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we're just so grateful for what it is that you've done. Hallelujah. To turn the light on in our lives, the redemption that Jesus provided for us. Help us, Father, to walk in the light of that word. As we come before you tonight, Father, we just commit these things. Father, help us not to fall prey to the subtleties of Satan. And Father God, help us to understand what it is that's going on in our lives. You're not the author of confusion, Father. You're the author of peace. So if anything in our lives, Father God, doesn't contribute to our peace, help us to see that for what it is. Help us, Father God, to make the changes we need to make. Hallelujah. Because there's no need for consternation. There's no need for worry, anxiety, or care. Because, Father, you care for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God, for helping men and women here within the sound of my voice and even online to find the answers that they need to the questions that they have. Thank you, Lord, for providing them with truth that can set them free. And I just thank you, Father God, for your blessing. Father, lead us and guide us in our giving tonight. We are so grateful that we can support the local work and what it is that you're doing in the, in the world today, Father God, in advancing the kingdom of God. So I want to thank you for guiding all of us as we give this evening, Father. And I thank you for your blessing on every person's life as they contribute, as they participate, and as they simply obey and honor you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated. God bless.